Exploring the tragic events of the 1968 Chilotilolco massacre, unraveling the truth. The 2nd of October, 1968, stands as one of the most somber days in Mexican history. On this fateful day, a multitude of students, professors, and supporters of the student movement were met with a hail of bullets in Chilotilolco. The truth of these events remained hidden by the government for over three decades, backed by newspapers and media outlets. However, with the dawn of the new century, declassified documents have begun to shed light on what transpired. In this narrative, we will delve into the chilling details of the 1968 Chilotilolco massacre, exploring its antecedents, the involvement of US government agencies, and the recent revelations about the responsible parties. Number 1, the 1968 Movement and its Demands The movement of 1968 emerged as a pivotal social uprising in Mexico, involving students, educators, intellectuals, and the general public. Spearheaded by institutions like the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, it aimed at democratizing Mexico after decades of rule by the Institutional Revolutionary Party, PRI. This movement sought to dismantle authoritarianism, address fraudulent electoral practices, secure the release of political prisoners, and implement policies to rectify societal inequalities. The movement's leading body, the National Strike Council, articulated specific demands to the government in matters of politics and social reform. The 1968 movement, driven by a desire for political change, arose after 50 years of uninterrupted PRI rule. Number 2, Placing the Chilotilolco Massacre in Context The 1968 movement was deeply intertwined with Mexico's post-revolution political, economic, and social transformation. Emerging from a history marked by social injustices, the nation embarked on a journey of change after the revolution. However, the pace of change fell short of addressing the pressing inequalities. The PRI, gaining dominance, neutralized or eradicated any dissent challenging its power. Although the 1968 massacre held immense influence over Mexican politics, it was not the first. After the revolution, Mexican sectors expressed their dissatisfaction with post-revolutionary governments. As early as 1942, during Manuel Avila Camacho's presidency, students from the National Polytechnic Institute were brutally suppressed for demanding recognition of their institution's degrees. Number 3, Labeling Students as Dissolute Elements The response to these student protests was often stigmatization by the government. The Polytechnic protest was tragically terminated, but it marked the beginning of a new phase for the Mexican student movement. Between 1949 and 1952, further actions occurred, culminating in the 1956 strike where 120,000 students demanded academic and economic reforms. The government dismissed these students as agitators and dissolute elements while responding with military force. During President Adolfo López Mateo's term, 1958-1964, demands intensified, leading to conflicts in the healthcare sector and wider societal unrest. Number 4, Prelude to the Tragedy Leading up to the Chilotilolco massacre, a series of events unfolded. In October 1966, President Diaz Ordos militarized the University of Michoacán, followed by the seizure of the University of Sonora in 1967. On July 26, 1968, two student demonstrations, one from the Polytechnic and the other from UNAM, converged in Mexico City's center. The merged protest was brutally suppressed, leaving over 500 injured and numerous arrested. Number 5, Escalation, and Suppression In the ensuing days, an onslaught of arrests without judicial orders targeted Communist Party members. On July 30, 1968, a soldier fired a bazooka shot, destroying the centuries-old door of the National Preparatory School No. 1. UNAM's rector, Javier Barros Sierra, led a protest march on August 1, 1968, demanding autonomy and freedom of expression. However, 
a faction of students criticized this march, alleging that it aimed to divert the movement's focus solely to university autonomy. Number 6, Accusations and Media Duel. As tensions escalated, a loyal federation of students aligned with the government accused the student movement of being tied to radical leftist ideologies. By August 3, 1968, Mexican newspapers presented conflicting viewpoints on the student movement. The government-affiliated National Federation of Technical Students FANET, alleged a national and international conspiracy against the Mexican government orchestrated by traditional provocateurs aligned with Maoism and Trotskyism. Conversely, the National Democratic Students Central CENEF, manifesto conveyed a stance of solidarity with revolutionary youth, stating that the movement aimed to defeat violence and pave the way for democracy. Number 7, The President Faces Public Discontent. On August 4, 1968, the student movement presented a list of demands, including the release of political prisoners, the repeal of sections of the Federal Penal Code related to social dissolution, dissolution of the Granadero Security Force, compensation for families affected by the conflict, and accountability for the violent events. The tide of public sentiment began to turn as, on August 27, 1968, a demonstration of around 30,000 individuals marched to the Socolo. Mexican President Gustavo Díaz Ordos faced public insults for the first time, setting the stage for further clashes. Number 8, An Unexpected Turn of Events In the early hours of August 28, military tanks entered the Socolo, dispersing the student encampment and pursuing students through nearby streets. Tanks were even mounted by some students, offering a symbolic image of government armored vehicles in the hands of its adversaries. The operation involved infantry battalions, police units, and even employees compelled to show support for the government. A government-sanctioned rally in support of the flag was thwarted by the military's intervention. Number 9, Tragedy Strikes Puebla. Amid escalating tensions, a tragic event unfolded on September 7, 1968. Four young workers from the Autonomous University of Puebla were lynched in San Miguel Canoa, accused of communism by the local priest. This event, marking a new low in the turmoil, was later depicted in the 1976 film Canoa. As emotions continued to run high, events such as the manifestation of torches in Chilotilolco and the March of Silence unfolded, culminating in further chaos and societal unrest. Number 10, Escalation and Confrontation. On September 15, 1968, student leader Evertu Castillo led a gathering at the UNAM, infuriating President Diaz Ordos. By September 18, the military had occupied the university campus, and soon after, UNAM's rector, Barros Sierra, resigned. By late September, violent clashes ensued. The Casco de Santo Tomas witnessed a confrontation resulting in 15 fatalities, while armed groups targeted the Instituto Politecnico Nacional. The government faced significant opposition, highlighted by the Botayona Olympia's alleged involvement in the Casco de Santo Tomas clashes. Number 11, The Ominous Gathering. With tensions reaching a boiling point, the fateful gathering was set for October 2, 1968. As October 1 unfolded, the military withdrew from UNAM and the Polytechnic. The National Strike Council announced a concentration for October 2 in the plaza of the three cultures within the Chilotilolco housing complex. Around 10,000 individuals, including students, educators and supporters, gathered. At 5.55 p.m., green flares were fired from the Secretariat of Foreign Relations building, marking the ominous prelude to the tragic events that would follow. Number 12, The Fateful Gathering and Its Goals. On October 1, 1968, the military withdrew from the UNAM and the Polytechnic, setting the stage for a pivotal event. The National Strike Council scheduled a gathering for October 2 in the plaza of the three cultures within the Chilotilolco housing complex. The intention was to assess the movement's progress and announce upcoming actions. 
around 10,000 attendees, including students, educators and sympathetic public members, converged at the plaza. A tense atmosphere prevailed as helicopters from both the police and military circled above. At approximately 5.55 p.m., green flares were launched from the Secretariat of Foreign Relations Building. Number 13, The Tragedy Unfolds. At around 6.15 p.m. on October 2, 1968, the tragic events began. Additional flares, one green and one red, were fired from a helicopter around 6 p.m. A force of 5,000 soldiers, supported by 200 tanks and military trucks, encircled the plaza. Amid the chaos, the initial shots were fired, leading to events that would remain shrouded in secrecy for over three decades. Despite numerous eyewitness accounts, the true sequence of events remained elusive due to government concealment. It wasn't until the early 21st century that declassified documents, both American and Mexican, allowed for a more objective examination and new conclusions. The question of who fired first remained unanswered, each side blaming the other. Number 14, Chaos Engulfs the Gathering. The concentration swiftly descended into chaos. The government claimed the initial shots originated from nearby apartment buildings, prompting the military's response. Students, however, insisted that government agents fired the first shots. Journalist Helena Poniatowska, author of La Noche de Chilotilolco, interviewed witnesses, describing the sudden appearance of flares in the sky followed by the first shots. Panic ensued, and the crowd scattered in all directions. The speakers on the National Strike Council's platform attempted to restore order, but the gathering devolved into chaos. The Botayon Olympia was then instructed to advance and apprehend movement leaders. Number 15, Violence Escalates. Clad in civilian attire with distinctive white gloves and scarves, members of the Botayon Olympia aimed to distinguish themselves from the demonstrators and protect against friendly fire. Captain Ernesto Morales Soto later disclosed that the agreed signal to close the entrances and exits of the plaza was a flare. The assault on the plaza resulted in numerous fatalities and injuries, as government forces fired upon the crowd and adjacent buildings, affecting protesters, bystanders, children, curious onlookers, and journalists alike. Among the injured was the Italian writer Oriana Falacci, who was initially mistaken for dead. Number 16, Lethal Force Deployed. Video evidence indicates that at least two companies from the Botayon Olympia utilized nearby buildings as firing positions. An apartment in the Molino del Rey building, owned by a sister-in-law of the then Secretary of Governance and future President Luis Echeverria, was used to house a machine gun. Official snipers were positioned on the roof of the Santiago de Chilotilolco church, while another machine gun was mounted on the 19th floor of the Foreign Relations Tower. A video shows soldiers allowing a group of individuals with white gloves to pass, seemingly identifying themselves. Number 17, The Night Unfolds. The massacre continued throughout the night of October 2nd, as soldiers and police systematically searched the plaza's buildings, apartment by apartment, in pursuit of hidden students. As the night progressed, power and telephone lines were cut in the Chihuahua building, and its vicinity. The wounded were transported to ambulances and then piled into military trucks without proper verification of their condition. The tragedy left a grim tableau, students, both deceased and wounded, were hastily loaded into military trucks, including those of the Urban Jungle Transport Company, their destinations shrouded in secrecy. Number 18, Media Backing Government Version. Newspapers supported the government's account, while witnesses reported that in the days following the massacre, government agents posing as public service employees inspected apartments in search of hidden students. The official government explanation alleged that armed provocateurs from the student sector, concealed in the buildings, initiated the gunfire. Government forces, considering them to be snipers, allegedly returned fire in self-defense. 
media outlets embraced this version, perpetuating the narrative that student snipers had attacked government forces, leaving them no choice but to respond. This media alignment with the government contributed to the obscuring rather than clarifying of events. On October 3rd, newspapers reported between 20 and 28 deaths, hundreds of injuries, and an equal number of arrests. Number 19, Jose Revueltas Imprisonment. Mexican writer Jose Revueltas, an activist from a prominent family of artists and intellectuals, was accused of being the mastermind behind the movement. He went into hiding for weeks, eventually being captured in November 1968 and sentenced to 16 years in Leckenberry Prison. He was released on parole two years later. Number 20, Public Reaction and Indifference. While over time, the Mexican populace grew more aware of the tragedy's scale, initially, deprived of accurate information by their own government and media, their response to the events following October 2 was one of indifference tinged with perplexity. Rosario Castellanos, journalist and writer, encapsulated the people's mood on October 3, saying, who's who? Nobody. The plaza was cleaned overnight, and the media focused on weather reports. Radio, television, and cinema programming continued unchanged. Number 21, Document Release and Revelations. In 2001, documents revealed that the massacre was carried out by the Botayon Olympia. It took until 1998, the 30th anniversary of the massacre, for the Mexican government to allow a congressional investigation into the Chilotilolco events. However, during the presidency of Ernesto Zadio, from the Institutional Revolutionary Party PRI, access to official documents related to the incident remained restricted. The document's disorder or purported lack of relevance was offered as an excuse. In 2001, Vicente Fox, from the National Action Party PN, took office, ending 70 years of continuous PRI rule. Fox authorized the release of documents, confirming the unofficial account that the massacre was the work of the Botayon Olympia. Number 22, Accountability Attempts. In 2002, President Fox appointed Ignacio Carrillo Prieto as special prosecutor to investigate the crimes committed in Chilotilolco, and prosecute the responsible parties. In July 2002, Echeverria became the first former Mexican president to be summoned for questioning in a judicial proceeding. In 2006, at the age of 84, he was arrested on charges of mass extermination. However, two years earlier, both the PRI and the PAN had passed an amendment to the penal code granting those over 70 the benefit of house arrest during legal proceedings. In 2009, Echeverria was released with legal reservations. When he passed away in July 2022 at the age of 100, he still faced ongoing legal proceedings. Number 23, U.S. Involvement Revealed. In 2003, documents from U.S. agencies were released, shedding light on the role played by the United States in relation to the massacre. Declassified papers from the CIA, Pentagon, FBI, Department of State, and the White House revealed that the U.S. had supplied arms, ammunition, military radios, and riot control equipment to Mexico before and during the crisis, justified by the Mexican government's concerns for Olympic Games security. CIA intelligence reports were shared with the Mexican government almost daily, with Echeverria telling the CIA six days before the massacre, the situation will be under complete control shortly. Number 24, General Oropesa's Justification. In his 1986 book Gustavo Diaz Ordos, The Man, The Politician, The Ruler, The Chief of the Presidential General Staff in 1968, General Luis Gutierrez Oropesa justified the massacre. He wrote that Gustavo Diaz Ordos had no alternative but to use force to contain the violence intended to engulf them. He claimed that the bloody events of October 2 were a result of a deliberate aggression targeting the Mexican army by subversives. 
he alleged that their manifest intent was to cause deaths on that day, providing them a banner to justify their actions and deliver the final blow. He argued that the army's reaction was swift, using weapons to repel the aggression. Number 25, 1968 Movement as a Milestone For several Mexican intellectuals, the 1968 student movement marked a milestone in Mexico's historical process. In his 1993 book The Disarmed Utopia, Jorge Costaneda noted that Mexico lacked a guerrilla explosion scene in other Latin American countries due to the significant 1968 movement. He argued that the events allowed a form of release for tensions and passions, acting as a vaccine against a full-scale armed struggle or proliferation of guerrillas, as seen elsewhere. It's been nearly 55 years since the Chilotilolco massacre, and October 2, 1968, remains etched in the memory of many Mexicans as one of the country's most tragic dates. We hope this information has been valuable to you. If you have anything to add, please share it in the comments section. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and share the link with your family and friends so they can also learn about these chilling aspects of the Chilotilolco massacre and the true culprits, Diaz, Echeverria, or the CIA. If you're new to our channel, don't forget to subscribe, and be sure to follow us on all our social media platforms, which you'll find in the description below. Thanks for watching. If you found this video interesting, make sure to subscribe to our channel and give this video a like. We'll be back soon with more curiosities from history.